Welcome back to Machine Translation. Today's lecture looks beyond parallel corpora, meaning we're going to look at other kind of uh, material that can be used to train machine translation system. This includes monolingual corpora and uh, corpora for other language pairs that might help assist training machine translation system for a targeted language pair. So let's first look a bit more broadly at data and machine learning to also introduce some jargon terms of different machine learning approaches that get kicked around in this particular context a lot. So first of all, there is a distinction between supervised learning and unsupervised learning. So the way we frame machine translation is as a supervised machine learning task. We actually have training examples with labels. So that means we have input sentences, that's our input, with the translation, that's the output. It's a bit more complicated than a lot of supervised learning tasks because the output is not just a simple class you have to predict, but it actually is an output that has to be constructed in several steps. And then there's additional problem, obviously, of machine translation having a lot of correct and acceptable translations, while our training translation is only one instance of one. Contrast this with unsupervised learning, where you only have the training examples, but not any labels. So if you would, in our case, just have sentences in the input language. So we will look at that, what we can do if we only have text in the input language, and we're also going to look if we only have text in the output language. Then there's semi-supervised learning, which basically means you have a mix of these two. You have some unsupervised data and you have some supervised data. So you have some labeled training data and some unlabeled training data, and usually there's much more unlabeled training data around. Then there's self-training, which is a basically already a method that makes predictions on the unlabeled training data and then used the, uses the predicted label as supervised training data. So this is just a way to artificially create training data. And uh, we will encounter that as well. Um, another term that's very important is transfer learning. So the idea is, to learn from, a da from data that is similar to the task we're actually targeting. So uh, this might be other language pairs. So first you train a model on, let's say, French-English, and then you train a model on German-English, and that's really what you want to have at the end. You want to have a German-English machine translation system. So you could do this in these stages, or you can train jointly on both of these language pairs. And we will talk about this as well. And then there's multitask tra training, which um, talks about training on a related task, for instance, part of speech tagging, question answering, any kind of linguistic analysis might come in there. And the idea is to share or some of the components of models that are dedicated to a particular task or that could be shared across all the tasks or in all, all language pairs. OK, we'll start with uh, looking at monolingual data. And this is a very broad field. And we're actually going to now review a lot of methods that deal with monolingual data. So the first use of monolingual data that we already encountered when we discussed statistical machine translation was the use of a language model. So a language model is something that is trained on large amounts of text in the target language. And the purpose of the language model is to have a better model of fluency, of just knowing what is acceptable language use in the target language. All for that is just you need large collections of target language. In statistical machine translation, it was really the key success. And rather surprisingly, in neural machine translation, um, there has been not really been much success in integrating neural language models into the model. So 
what is rather being done is to create artificial data and back translation. But let's look at both of these uh, uh, options. So let's first look at adding a language model. So training a separate language model, that should be pretty straightforward. We actually talked about training language models before we talked about training translation models with deep learning techniques. Um, and then we can add that as conditioning context to the decoder. So recall um, state progression in the decoder. So we have a decoder state. We have embedding of the previous word and here the input context. So this was our state progression in the recurrent neural network. So we compute the next state given the previous state and the last word we produced and the relevant context at this moment in time. And now the idea is we also going to have a language model state. So the language model state observes the language model sequence. And uh, we uh, it then also has some obviously preferences about what the next word would be, uh, what words fit in here well, what words fit in less well. And this is, can be used then as an additional input when we actually compute the next state to make the prediction about what the next word should be. So you can pre-train a language model and then leave its parameters fixed during translation model training. So this is something that is just going to be uh, pre-computed. It's not going to have any parameter anymore when we do the translation model training. So there are refinements to this idea. So uh, you want to balance the impact of the language model versus the translation model. So why don't we do what we have done uh, previously is to learn a scaling factor, which uh, are called gates in deep learning. So we're going to have a gate that basically says, how much are we going to trust a language model? And that can be learned from the language model state or not. So the language model, for instance, in some cases can be very certain about what the next word should be. And sometimes it's not very certain. And then we can use it to scale the values of the language model state and how much they contribute to the prediction of the next decoder state. So this is now the scaled language model state that comes in here when we predict the next decoder state. What we described here is also called deep integration of the language model into the neural machine translation system because it really kind of becomes one element that then the model can reason over and make predictions over. So there's still here an option of the decoder to, to what account uh, and how, to what way it factors in making decisions over the next states. An alternative to that is what also has been explored is shallow integration. And that is much more closely to uh, ensemble methods where we said uh, we can also train multiple models each of, each of them predict, contributes to the prediction about what the next word is. Each of them is going to have a probability assessment of the next word. And uh, uh, we can have the language model then as one of these uh, mechanisms that make predictions. That is something that has been explored recently uh, more frequently than these kind of deep integration schemes. But as I said, uh, the more common technique to deal with monolingual data is back translation. This is a bit of a hacky solution, um, but it works. And uh, maybe uh, there is some pathway towards a more principled solution, but maybe we just will be stuck with that. OK, so here's how it works. So the idea is monolingual data is basically parallel data that misses its other half. So if you have monolingual data in the target language, well, it's basically parallel data that needs a source. So how do we get the source? And the idea is let's just synthesize that half. So it starts with, we first gonna build, uh, we first have the parallel corpus, and we use it to first build a reverse system that translates from the target language to the source language. We then use that to translate monolingual data in the target language into a source language. So this gives us then additional synthetic parallel data. So when we put this together, we have um, the original parallel data here, 
and we have the synthetic parallel data. And what's kind of indicated by the colors here is that um, the target site is always proper uh, modeling, proper text in the target language. This is all valid text. It's always going to be trained on um, output text that is actually valid text. So it only learns to predict valid text in the target language. This is not exactly true for the source language. So the upper half here, that is still valid source text. This here is machine translated text, which might be somewhat corrupted. But this is, since it's something we condition on, uh, it's less harmful than the other way around. So here are the steps again, uh, just uh, spelled out in text. So we first train a system in the reverse language direction. Then we use the system to translate the, the target site monolingual data. So this gives us a synthetic parallel corpus. And then we combine the synthetic parallel corpus with the real parallel corpus to build the final system. So uh, in practice, uh, you should have roughly equal amounts of synthetic or real data. There have been some experiments in varying it. Apparently, we can, can get away with having a bit more synthetic parallel data than real data. And it also turns out this is a pretty good method for domain adaptation. So if we have target site data in the domain, uh, but we don't have much parallel data in the domain, this is a method to generate a lot of parallel data that at least on the target side perfectly matches the domain. So we can continue this process uh, in a way called iterative back translation. So the quality of the back translation system matters. So if you build a better back translation system, uh, we can get better synthetic data to train our system. So how can we build a back, better back translation system? Well, by also have back translated data for that. So here is now a bit more convoluted system. So we start out with our first back translation system, which actually goes in the right language direction. We use this to create, to translate monolingual text in the source language and uh, basically have then the target site for that, combine this. And now we trans build a back translation system. So this back translation system, whenever we build a system, the target site is always correct data. So this is always correct data in the target site, actually observed uh, text in, uh, the, in the end output side of the translation system. So this is now our back translation system. We're now actually back to where we were before. So we build a system in the reverse direction, um, take target language text to synthesize source language text, and then put all that together. And that's our final system. OK, here's some results on experiments with that to just give you some indication about like how important is the quality of back translation and how much you can gain from it. And you get actually substantial gains. Um, so this has been uh, become a very standard technique that is pretty much used in low resource, high resource, any kind of scenario. OK. So one attempt of uh, making this a bit more a principled approach, um, one name for that is round trip training. So we could iterate through these steps of training system, creating synthetic corpus and so on, or we can do something called also dual learning. So we train models in both directions together. So we at the same time build the translation model from uh, language F into language E and a model that trains from language E to the model F. Then we take a monolingual sentence F, translate it into a sentence E. We can at this point not evaluate if this is a good sentence because it's just a translation and we don't have a reference for it because it's a monolingual sentence, but we can translate it back into the language F. So, and then we can check uh, if F and F dash here uh, match up. So these two have to match up. And if they don't match up, then something went wrong in our training. Um, so this perfect setup could possibly be fooled by if uh, all we're going to learn in these models is to copy the data. So if you copy the data, then obviously uh, this is a very trivial process. 
So we just copy the sentence F into the sentence E, and we sentence, copy the sentence E back into the sentence S dash here. And uh, that's pretty easy to do, and we haven't really learned anything useful. We just learned a system that can copy text, but actually doesn't translate it. So one thing to avoid this is to score this resulting sentence E dash with, uh, a lang with a language model for language E. So we can add a language model sc score as a cost objective for training. So here's a visual illustration of this. So you take foreign sentences, round trip it here first, also score it with a language model, and then round trip it back. And then you can score it here, or you can do um, the equivalent starting um, on this side with the English sentence, translate into a foreign sentence F, and then back into a self English sentence E and check how well it works, and also check it with a language model in the language F. Um, so there have been uh, some attempts. It's technically rather difficult to set that up. Um, also, from a training objective point of view, it's not very efficient use of the data because we what we can do at the end is really just score the sentence in total, and uh, uh, that's we don't get a each time we predict the word we don't get immediately feedback as we did in our original training uh, we pretty much have to first generate a whole translation and then from that whole translation when we translate back we can then score each word um, but not um, kind of uh, immediately a round trip and then there's also the question should we only translate one translation e here or should we translate multiple ones and so on and so on so there's a lot of devil in the details and uh, as I said, there have been several attempts to build this properly, but it hasn't really been super successful. So the question about how to make this process of iterative back translation actually efficient and useful uh, beyond kind of this synthetic data generation and kind of pipelining this process is an open challenge. Um, some variants on this idea of creating synthetic data from just monolingual data. Uh, one is copy target. So one concern is if you're in a, especially if you're in a low resource scenario where you just don't have a good neural machine translation system to synthesize the data. So any synthetic data is going to be crappy. So uh, you could just copy the target language text to the source. Uh, this has been shown to help in low resource data conditions. Another one is uh, forward translation. So why do we actually build a back translation system to translate data to synthesize it? Why don't we just take monolingual text in the source language, translate it, and pretend that's additional training data? This technique is also called self-training. Uh, it's been generally shown to be inferior, but sometimes successful. Let's move to another uh, way of uh, using monolingual data called unsupervised machine translation. And uh, as unsupervised machine translation already implies is, this is pretty much the radical idea of, let's say we don't have any parallel data at all. We just have a lot of monolingual text in the source language and a lot of monolingual text in the target language. Are we still able to build machine translation systems? And uh, this works surprisingly well, obviously, if you have large amounts of parallel data, you're always going to do better. So you might still remember from earlier lecture on monolingual word embedding spaces that uh, there are various techniques also in the training of neural machine translation system where at the earliest stage, each word, each word gets mapped to a vector and that vector is called the word embedding. So the very first step when you kind of map the one hot vector that just indexes the input tokens, uh, the first thing it, uh, that happens after that, it gets mapped to a continuous space vector. That's the word embedding. And there's also a word embedding on the output side. Um, if you just care about training word embeddings, you'd usually use some language model type of setup. So this gives you um, word embedding spaces. And uh, the assumption is that they have similar shape. 
and why would they have similar shape well because you know they represent concepts that have similarities and uh, and therefore they're going to be used similarly in language so the way people talk about dogs and cats is quite similar they're both pets that treat them the same way a lot of you know you feed your cat you know you watch your cat uh, and so on just look for your cat and so on you do all these things you do it with a cat and a dog yeah you don't do any of these things for a lion you don't feed your lion people don't usually feed their lions because they don't have lions um, so these two words are much more closely related and lion is much more distant and for some reason lion might still be closer to cat than it's to dog first of all because they are more closely related uh, from a biological point of view and maybe they also have some properties where you talk about them that they have whiskers and things like that okay um this is the uh so this is this is how the shape would look like for English, and here now the German words for it: Löwe is lion, Hund is dog, Katz says cat, and it should have a similar shape. So the intuition is: can we? Is there any kind of way to learn automatically how to match up, in this case, these triangles? And if you just kind of glare at it long enough, uh, we would say there's really just one way to match up these triangles, and that is this way. And that's kind of the closest match of putting these triangles on top of each other. And uh, see and behold, what happens is that cat and Katze line up and lion and Löwe line up and dog and hund line up. Um, there are other ways to line up the embedding spaces. Uh, one method is to just use a seed lexicon of identically spelled words, numbers, names, um, so cognates or words that are actually untranslatable. So if you know these two points this word and that word match up need to have the same uh, vector then you can learn a mapping function uh, that constraints on your mapping function and you can learn then the mapping to constrain basically uh, to optimize the uh, mapping of the seed lexicon there are various other methods uh, there's an adversarial training method where um, the dis discriminator is there to predict which language a word or the projection of a word is in and then there's also uh, another method called uh, VecMap uh, where we first construct a matrix with word similarity scores so this would contain for instance score for how close cats and hund are and how close cats and Löwe are so you have then a matrix for each word about what words are they related to and then you try to match up these matrices okay so let's move on so what let's say we did that and we matched up words uh, we can use this now to build a translation model so this is now a word translation model so we can induce word translations so for each word we can map it to the other languages space and find the nearest neighbors there. So these are all the possible or most likely translations of this word. And then we just kind of convert that into a statistical phrase translation table where the similarity that we computed there in terms of nearest neighbor distance uh, can be converted to a probability. We can also use a language model. Um, this is just a target side modeling language model and lo and behold we have a statistical phrase-based machine translation system the two main component we have the translation model we have the language model that's a statistical phrase-based machine translation system so we can now move beyond inducing word translations we now actually have a system that does sentence translation so then uh, with that we can uh, create doing something, something similar to the back translation approach, we, we can create synthetic parallel data. So we're going to take text in the source language, run it through our inferred system, so the system we just created, and uh, we get translation in the target language. So this is now a synthetic parallel corpus. So now we kind of keep doing this and recall the spirit of the EM algorithm. So we have one to learn a perfect model but we don't have the data so what do we do well first of all we go through the one step that predicts the data so we generate translations for monolingual corpus then we have a parallel corpus so we have the data and we can use that to predict the model 
So now we have a model that is predicted from the synthetic data. And obviously, we're going to iterate of this process several times and alternate between that language direction. Um, the most successful way of doing this is to start out with statistical machine translation and then increasingly use neural machine translation uh, models for data synthesis, or basically take both synthesized data from statistical MT and synthesized data from neural MT and combine that together. Let's move on to a next uh, range of data sources we can exploit to build better machine translation systems. And that is using data for multiple language pairs. So there are obviously more than two languages in the world, and we may want to build systems for many languages. And then typically, what all the we talked about so far is we're going to build a separate model for each. If you build a French-English system, we take a French-English corpus. If you build a Spanish-Chinese system, we take a Spanish-Chinese corpus. Well, but why should we do that? We can also just train jointly a model on all the parallel corpora together. And that is then a universal translator that can take any language, input language and produce output in every output language. So um, let's just start with uh, having a system that has multiple input languages. So we take German English data and French English data, combine it, we just concatenate the training data, and uh, then train a system. So the joint model that we train will benefit from the exposure to more English data. So we're going to have more English data be exposed because the English that we get from the German English system and the English that we get from the French English system is going to be helpful. So if you think about the different parts of a machine translation system, the decoder part that has to generate a fluent English text is going to benefit from that. So this has been shown to be beneficial in low resource conditions. And one open question is obviously, do these languages have to be related for this to work? And um, the answer currently is maybe not. So let's look at the other scenario where we have multiple output languages. So now we have a French English corpus and we have a French Spanish corpus. Again, we do the same thing. We concatenate the training data. But then we have the problem, obviously, given a French input sentence, what should the system produce? Should it produce now an English translation or a Spanish, Spanish translation? So we have to specify that somehow to the system because it, it, given just exposed to the training data, it might do one or both or either. So here's the idea. Why don't we just have a special tag that we attach to each source sentence, which informs us what that should be translating to. So if you put an English tag in front of it, it translates this translation here. This is not the case of double standards. But if you put the Spanish tag in front of it, then it's just supposed to produce uh, a Spanish output here, no credo verse, and so on. OK, um, we can now throw everything together. And uh, one thing you can maybe additionally try when we have our corpus, we have a French English corpus, we have a uh, French English corpus, French Spanish corpus, and German English corpus. We train our system with that. Uh, so it should do a pretty good job of translating from French English and French Spanish and German English. But is it also able to translate from German to Spanish? This is called zero shot uh, because we now actually try the system to make inferences that uh, for, for a task that is actually never seen any training data for. However, it definitely has learned how to encode German. So it will have some representation of German. And it also definitely has learned how to generate Spanish. It definitely was trained on data where it had to generate Spanish. So there's a reason to believe that it might actually pull that off. Uh, how well does it work? Um, so, so just in practice, so this is now kind of spelled out. We train on these corpora, and then we're going to say, uh, we're going to put in a German sentence here, messen wir heute nicht mit zweierlei Maß, and we're going to say, produce some Spanish from that. And it's never seen this in training, but can it at test time produce the right translation? 
Um, there is some, some uh, this, this idea is already dates back to 2016 where this was proposed and uh, kind of the idea is that in the middle stages of this model it has to kind of create some universal language, it has to have some meaning, in independent, language independent representation of meaning to then generate any kind of output language from it. Um, so there were some wild claims being made. Uh, Google's AI just created its own universal language and uh, there was some research on that. Uh, the actual translation quality of these systems for these zero threat directions were rather poor. They were not terrible, but uh, definitely not as good as anything where you had parallel data. They were, for, however, in the stage where if you added a little bit of parallel data, they actually could, could improve quite a lot. Oh yeah, here's actually some actual results. Um, so we want to build a Portuguese Spanish system we don't have any portuguese spanish data let's pretend we don't have any portuguese spanish data so uh, one thing you can do is bridging which means you first build a system that translates from portuguese to english and then from english to spanish so this is what we have we have portuguese english we have that parallel corpus and we have english spanish we have that parallel corpus so we can just basically chain, build two separate systems and chain them together. That's a reasonable thing to do. This is pretty much um, probably still up to now the default solution for if you want to translate Icelandic to uh, Swahili. Um, it's probably going to go over English first. You can do this with neural purpose as a phrase-based statistical machine translation. You can do it with neural machine translation where better results were done. Um, this is kind of the the upper bound, where if you actually use a Portuguese Spanish corpus, how well does it do? And these here now are the actual models where zero shot is being done. Um, so we have Portuguese English and then English Spanish, and we just throw this together. Here's another model where you have uh, uh, both translation directions and, and throw that in. Uh, the last solution is uh, doing this model here as initialization and then adding some parallel data and there are some benefits to that. Okay, um, in general if you want to build generic neural machine translation models and just run it over multiple language pairs, uh, that's what we've done so far. So what could we do better? Uh, what if we just still kind of have separate systems but share some components? So maybe we have an encoder that is shared in models with the same input language and we have a decoder that is shared in models with the same output language. So you're gonna have, if you have multiple input languages, multiple output languages you deal with, you might then have multiple encoders and multiple decoders, but it scales linearly with a number of languages and not quadratic with the number of language pairs. So um, one of the early methods did this and also had an attention mechanism that is shared in all the models. So sharing means it has the same parameters and whenever you train on a particular language pairs, these parameters get updated and these updated parameters and also affect all the other uh, language pair systems. Uh, since you decide which encoder and decoder you use, there's no, no need to mark the output language. More recently, there has been a trend towards massively multilingual training. So this is the idea of doing basically what we just talked about and do it for many, many languages and just throw everything together. Um, this started out with uh, first many to English. So we take dozens of languages, maybe even a hundred languages and have parallel corpora for them paired with English and figure out how to translate them for English. Um, that's kind of where corpora exist. Most of the parallel corpus we have exist paired with English. And then also to the reverse direction of translating from English to all these many languages. And uh, most recently, just translating everything to everything. This work is mainly motivated by improving low resource language pairs. So for low resource language pairs, we just don't have much training data. So they would really benefit from having been exposed to more of the input language and more of the output language, even if it is in different language combinations. 
Um, there's also a move towards build a larger models with these. Um, here's some uh, uh, pictures from uh, Google where they made this argument where they moved towards building a machine translation system for 103 languages, everything into English, everything out of ling English. Um, this is from 2019. Um, this is actually an interesting chart where they show how much training data they have. So this ranges from up here. Uh, oh, here's the training data. Uh, in the order of billions of words to down here, where it is not even a million words of parallel data, so this is log scale. And then the affecting, so the, all the language pairs here are sorted by how much training data you have. And then here they are listed what the translation quality is, um, we're using some version of blue score on a somewhat standardized way. And uh, you see that the translation quality is pretty good as long as you have. Um, at least, I don't know, uh, 10 million uh, words of training data, and then they kind of do deteriorate. Um, so uh, what if we then, instead of doing training these individual systems, throw everything together? And this is what they found. So they built these massively multilingual systems. And this was the first attempt. Basically, this is taking the usual architecture they have, with this massively multilingual system, just throw all the training data together. And yes, um, you saw nice gains for low resource. Um, it did hurt the high resource language pairs a bit. And that's mainly because now suddenly you have to share parameters with all these other language pairs, so you can't do as well on optimizing for a particular language pair. So to remedy that was, now well, let's just have additional parameters. And these may be language specific parameters, or they just may be just bigger models. Um, and uh, if you have uh, instead of 400 million parameters, which is the default model, have a model with 6 billion parameters, so this is now 15 times more, then you actually never lose translation quality and you still see uh, gains, uh, strong gains for low resource languages, actually fairly strong gains for low resource languages. And then of course, once you realize more parameters gives you better models, why not go out and have a model with 50 billion parameters? And then you can train even bigger models. Obviously at this point, 50 billion parameters training on 100 language pairs at the same time, this is becomes computationally quite expensive. Um, one other technique that was proposed to make uh, these kind of multilingual training uh, more effective is to deal with the fact that uh, languages are written in different scripts. So this is here Aramaic, um, you have here uh, Arabic, I guess, or maybe this is Arabic, uh, this is some Hindi script uh, or like some Indian script and so on. Um, this is Cyrillic. Uh, so there's all these different writing systems. And of course, if you then, you have to have a shared vocabulary for all these languages. This is going to fragment your vocabulary quite a lot. And you also don't benefit from certain similarities. For instance, here's all different ways how Philippines are written. And they actually obviously in, in all these languages have uh, the, the, the country name still is has a very similar name. And uh, uh, you don't really benefit from that anymore if your one Philippine here is written uh, suddenly like this. So that you don't share any byte pair elements at all, any subwords at all. So the idea is to kind of break that up. First, Romanize everything. So Romanize meaning to convert it into Latin script. So that script that is used for English. And then uh, run byte pair encoding. And then you see that you have actually shared pipe pairs uh, for words for these different languages. And you might do better at maybe especially translating names, but also uh, cognates. So I just want to bring up the most recent uh, work in this space. So this is a currently super active field. This is a very recent paper on building uh, machine translation systems for 100 languages from any of these languages into any of the languages and also using training data that exists not for all 100 times 100 language pairs but uh, for many many more and uh, not always just relying on 
English as either input or output in the training data. Okay, so this is obviously a bit more press release kind of story. So our machine translation system now is an AI model. Uh, it was the same in the Google paper. Um, here's some details on that, but you can actually uh, follow also the link on the web page for this class to see the details of this article. So they have 7.5 billion sentences mined from web crawl data. So sentence is always a bit of unclear measure uh, how long the sentences are, but web crawl data you would expect maybe average length, 15, 20 words. So we are here in the, in the order of probably about 100 billion words, in the order of 100 billion words of training data. Uh, they build a model with 15 billion parameters, so not quite as gigantic as the previous one. And uh, they show improvements, especially for low recess languages with this. Okay, so the final thing we're gonna look at is multitask training. So this is taking even further departure of uh, not just monolingual data, parallel data, but maybe even completely different data that might be useful to train general NLP models and also then, of course, machine translation. So um, what translation models are are pretty generic sequence to sequence models. So this is the architecture. And if you uh, actually look at methods being used in natural language processing uh, in general, they use all kinds of uh, variants of the sequence to sequence models. Often they just adopted models that are pioneered in machine translation research. The same model we pretty much presented here is used for things like sentiment detection, grammar correction, semantic inference, summarization, question answering, speech recognition. And uh, for all these tasks, we need to learn basic properties of language. For all these tasks, we need to have word embeddings. We need to uh, also then contextualize, contextualize the word representations in the encoder. So all of these methods need an encoder stage. And they also, when they generate output language, which all the listed tasks here do, maybe not sentiment detection, uh, they also have some kind of language model aspect in the decoder. So why reinvent the wheel at each time? So why do you have dedicated training data for each of these tasks and then train on them? Why don't you just say, we're going to build a new machine translation model? Uh, at this point, really a natural language processing model that does all these tasks, or at least shares components across all these tasks. So we train a model on several tasks and maybe have shared or task specific and task specific components. And then the system learns general facts about language, which are informed by the different tasks and they're useful different tasks. Um, so here we actually may be arguing even beyond uh, sharing data, and that's a nice thing. But for instance, if we train a machine translation system and we train a syntactic parser at the same time, the syntactic parser forces our models to be more cognizant of syntactic structure. And just being aware of syntactic structure might actually also help machine translation because it clearly affects uh, what kind of reordering is more likely than other. So let's just start simple. Um, let's just say, okay, all we wanna do is we want to pre-train word embeddings. That's one task. We're gonna have some kind of language model, way of training word embeddings and put them into our new machine translation model. So the first component, just kind of the word embedding lookup, we're gonna put that in. So the new machine translation model obviously uses word embeddings both to encode the input words and also to encode the output words. And these word embeddings can be trained from vast amounts of monolingual data. So we pre-train these word embeddings and then initialize the model with them. This has actually not been successful um, so far. Um, maybe one of the reasons is that monolingual word embeddings trained on language model objectives are quite different than uh, word embeddings that are needed for machine translation. To give you one example, so if you look at the word teacher in teaching, from a machine translation perspective, especially if you translate out of the language of English here, 
these are really quite similar. The semantics are almost identical. We're talking here about the process of teaching and uh, that needs to be translated in the output and expressed in the output. The concept is quite similar. Yes, one is a noun and the other one is a verb. But from a language point of view, these are actually really different words. Um, they occur in very different contexts. They have very different surrounding words. The word the occurs in front of teacher, but never in front of teaching and so on. So um, how about the decoder? So the decoder could be informed by um, a language model um, uh, that we pre-train as well. So we can also have a pre-trained language model. So we just pre-train the decoder uh, as a language model and then use that. Uh, so the way we do this, we actually have the neural machine translation architecture and set the input context always to zero, train it on large amounts of monolingual text, and then proceed to, uh, 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 to uh, translation model decoder. So um, the same we can do for the encoder. So it is, has a similar structure as a language model. It is not optimized in machine translation to predict following words because the input sentence is always fully given and fully accessible. But still, we can pre-train it as a language model on monolingual text. OK, here is uh, another idea. Um, this is kind of also more reflective of how um, pre-training is currently done. So uh, this is kind of the, the sort of uh, data setup that is used to do these massively pre-trained language models for transformer architectures. And we did mention that once before. Um, so the idea is we first going to train the neural machine translation model on just monolingual data. And how do we do this? Uh, we don't train it as a language model, but we train it as kind of an input to output. And we do two things to text. So at the bottom is just regular text. So what we're going to predict is just regular text as it occurs. So this is kind of a weird text um, from a web page or something, uh, a sequence of three sentences. And then we change the input so that uh, we first um, uh, take uh, some sequences of words, for instance, here, two with clients and replace it with just a padding token. So this is the first idea. We replace some input words with this pad token. Um, so the paper that proposed this said we should do this for 30% of the words, but we also mean multiple word sequences, but it could also be multiple padding tokens per sentence. The second thing we do is uh, we reorder sentences. So if you look closely, um, what happened here is this is here the middle sentence. Here it's the first sentence. So what we did here was to swap the order of these two sentences. So these got reordered. So this is here the task. So you give me input that has um, um, a sequence with gaps in them and words in different order and sentences in different orders, a sequence of three sentences, and it has to predict a, a sequence of three sentences from it where the gaps are filled. So it has to learn something about kind of what are plausible words to insert there. So what context, you know, arises to kind of what, what can fill the context, uh, the, 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 the pad token they are given the context. And uh, it also has to produce fluent output text. So this is a model that is able to learn something about encoding input and being aware of uh, the input context and also a model that produces output text. So you, try, you, you, do, you prepare data like this both in the source and the target language. So if you do a Chinese English system, you do this both for Chinese text and Arabic and English text. OK, um, so let's just finish up with going over multitask training. So uh, multiple end-to-end -end tasks uh, might share common as as aspects. So it might be language modeling and uh, 
machine translation, but it might be also all the other things. They all need to encode the input sequence and they all need to produce the output word sequence, uh, but might have very different inputs and outputs. So in sentiment detection, the output is just a sentiment value, so the generation step is actually quite different. However, the input is a sequence in the language. Part of speech tag, the output is a tag sequence, again, quite different. In syntactic parsing, the output is a recursive parse structure. In semantic parsing, the output is a logical form, database queries, or abstract meaning representation. In grammar correction, the input is error-prone text. The output is then clean, proper text. So this actually produces fluent text. Question answering also produces fluent text but may also be informed by knowledge bases, or it really is just trained on massive amounts of, uh, of natural language text. And speech recognition, the input is a sequence of acoustic features, but the output is a text sequence. So the last three tasks here all produce text as output. And uh, all these tasks here um, uh, take natural language text as input. Actually, all of them accept speech recognition. So, um, so a lot of these natural language processing tasks, input and output, are in the same language. Uh, so it mostly learns copying operations, maybe, or it at least has to do some copying operations, especially true for grammatic error correction or automatic post editing, where most of the words are going to be copied and only a few words are going to be changed. And even question answering, maybe some words on the question make it repeated in the answer. And also in semantic inference, where you say, given this premise, how likely is this consequence? There's probably also a lot of overlap between the premise and the consequence. OK, so you could train, again, a model of all these tasks. But if you do joint model training, you can get various benefits. And there have been positive uh, 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 results reported with the joint training of part of speech taking named entity recognition, syntactic parsing, semantic analysis, and so on. Um, I think nowadays everything is pretty much driven by underlying training on monolingual data with kind of a language model objective as a first step that kind of then drives all these tasks. So this is kind of the foundational task. And um, that's it for today. So it's a bit of a rundown of how to use different kinds of training data for training machine translation models. And uh, that's it for today, and I'll see you in the next lecture.